Only live. All right, here we are, and I want to welcome everyone on the uh, webinar today, and thank you for. Uh, you're going to be listening to two lawyers discuss the topic of pet trusts. My name is Howard Strauss, and I'm from Strauss Law Firm. Our office is located in Oldsmar, and we have Peggy Hoyt. She, too, is an attorney. Uh, her office is in Oviedo, Florida, which is not too far from Florida, and I've known Peggy for several years. We first met as the members of the National Network of Estate Planning Attorneys, and I think, Peggy, you are now in Wealth Council, correct? I am a member of Wealth Council. Okay. Are, are you still with the National Network? No longer with the National Network, now with Wealth Council and Elder Council. And Elder Council. Okay. And, and you're also a board certified, not in one, but two areas, correct? That's correct. Both yeah. Will's Trust and Estates and in Elder Law. Wow. Yeah. And there's very, very few p attorneys who are board certified in anything, let alone two areas. In fact, I'll bet... That's correct, Howard. I think uh, uh, less than 10 who are dual board certified in those areas in the state of uh, Florida. And uh, uh, so we're, we're really happy to have uh, uh, Peggy. And she's also written a book. And it's got a very clever title that's very true. It says, uh, it's entitled, All My Children Wear Fur Coats, I believe. Isn't that correct? That is correct. All my yeah. children wear fur coats. How to leave a legacy for your pet. Yeah. So, the, uh, and so I, of all the people that I know, uh, I think Peggy is eminently qualified to, to discuss this subject and many more. We don't have time for many subjects, so we're going to focus on one that is near and dear to our hearts. Uh, Peggy, I know you have uh, canines and felines, and I think you have horses too, correct? I do have horses. I have three horses, seven dogs, and two cats. Wow. So uh, Peggy practices what she preaches. And, and I can tell you I have one. One canine, little Sadie, who is in the picture with me. Uh, she is eight years old, and she is at all of 13 and a half pounds. And she comes to my office every day that I'm here. And uh, I know Peggy brings, uh, well, maybe not her horse, but she brings uh, at least some of your pets to the office occasionally, don't you, Pe Peggy? I do. I have my pet, Don Layton, is usually with me every day. We now have a kitten named Forrest. And yesterday, anybody who was unfortunate enough to come in would also have met Holly, my mini dachshund. Uh <laughs> <laughs> is she uh, uh, ha have quite a spirited personality? She has a very spirited personality, and for the dachshund lovers out there, I call her Holly the Weasel. <laughs> yeah, the I I find that having uh, my little uh, buddy Sadie in with me here puts clients at ease. Uh, I have only had one client that couldn't have her in the conference room at the same time, not because she didn't like dogs, but because she was allergic <laughs> and, and through the dander of the dogs. So, but other than that, nine times out of ten, Sadie will be sitting on their lap within five minutes of the conference. And Absolutely. Just, I understand, and that happens in our office all the time. And it's great because it puts them at ease. A lot of times people come in our office and they're, and I'm sure yours too, they've lost a loved one, a friend, uh, or, or it's something that's not pleasant for them to do. And they're uptight. They may never have talked with an attorney before. So coming into an office like that just makes them feel at least a little bit more at home. And uh, and for that, I, I thank my buddy uh, Sadie. And, uh, and I know any other attorney like Peggy would do the same. And um, uh, for those uh, that are listening that don't know about Wealth Council, uh, and also the National Network of Estate Planning Attorneys, but Wealth Council is uh, the preeminent uh, organization in the United States for attorneys who deal with, uh, in a very gen you know, I'm speaking very generally now, uh, in estate planning. They, they also have, they focus on business planning, elder law, which is, if, if you will, a subset of uh, estate planning. Elder law certainly deals with estate planning, but many other things. And um, also, you have, so you have two other lawyers in your office. Is that correct? 
I do. I have my partner, Randy Bryan, and we will celebrate 15 years together this year. Wow. And we met at the National Network of Estate Planning Attorneys, and then oh. also Sarah Allmiller, who's our associate attorney. And if I may, I want to brag a little bit about Randy. He is an officer. He's a commander, I believe, or a lieutenant commander. I can't remember which. He's in the a Navy. commander now. He's a commander now. And that's a very high rank in the Navy. And he was in Iraq for a year, uh, which the whole time he was over there, I was uh, very concerned about him being there. But he came back in one piece. And uh, I, know, I, I know Randy uh, reasonably well. And he's a terrific uh, uh, person. And he's certainly a terrific attorney. And uh, both Peggy, I don't know your third lawyer, but I'm, I suspect if uh, she's associated with the two of you, she's a pretty good person. And uh, so uh, when, when I thought about having a, a webinar on the subject of pet trust and just what do you do if somebody gets real sick and has a pet or they pass away, I, I immediately thought of Peggy. I've read her book. I, I've been in breakout sessions that Peggy has taught at the National Network and um, I followed her career uh, for the last several years and so I know that uh, she's more than qualified to talk about this and I was going to ask you do you do you find any resistance Peggy for people when you say gee let's talk a little bit about assuming that they have pets uh, do you find people don't think it's necessary to talk about that or they they seem surprised when you bring the subject up I think they seem pleased when I bring the subject up and it would be the rare individual who didn't want to talk about their kids their pets or their grandkids so they're <laughs> always happy to discuss that uh -huh. Uh, the, I, I have found it sometimes it surprises them they don't even think about it in fact that's the last thing they would think of not that they d don't like their pets but we have one client that has uh, uh, horses but he, he also has a llama he used to have a camel he has a couple cows uh, lots of chickens so it's not just dogs and cats but I of course the the vast majority of our clients that have pets are going to be either canines or felines and uh, but there's certainly a fair amount of them that have horses and maybe even some other animals uh, such as my uh, one client that I just mentioned so all of them can be involved in a pet trust and uh, Peggy uh, if you would please just uh, do you do you have anything unusual about pet trust that you do or that you want to advise cl uh, people about that they should consider when uh, you know they have pets and they want to make sure they're taken care of uh, in their estate plan? Absolutely, and uh, I think the things to consider that are most important are number one, who's going to be the pet caregiver and then who are going to be the alternates to that pet caregiver in the event that that person is unable or unwilling at that time to provide day-to-day -day care for the pets. So that's one aspect. The second aspect is who's going to be the trustee, the person who's responsible for the administration of the trust assets. And then thirdly, in a lot of my plan, we include what I call an animal care panel which might be a group of friends and or your veterinarian who acts as an advisory panel to both the caregiver and to the trustee. Oh, that's an excellent idea. Um, that way, in other words, uh, someone that's, they're not necessarily uh, responsible for taking care, but they can give advice to the caregiver uh, or help them out if the caregiver gets sick or something or uh, or, is, or has to leave for a couple of days or something like that would they be able to fill in is that uh, well is that, that might be job? one yeah that might be one use of an animal care panel other um, uses might be to review periodic veterinary um, health checkups to make sure that the animals are being properly cared for um, in some events, they might be empowered to appoint a successor pet caregiver if we um, don't have one that's readily available. And then also for um, extreme health situations and or possible euthanasia. So just giving that checks and balance um, to both the pet caregiver and the trustee. Now, in terms of the amount of money that might be set aside. I mean, a lot of every time I I, I bring up this sub 
uh, subject about the money that would be set aside. I get often I get uh, references to the lady that was in New York City. I think she owned her, her family owned the Empire State Building, and she she passed away had many many dollars, but big big estate, and she left like two million dollars uh, for the care of her poodle. Um, I don't think it probably would require that kind of money. And I know in Florida we can't do that. I think people are, to some extent, might be concerned about that. Uh, do you set aside a specific amount of money, or just, or do you say uh, amount to care for, and then you sort of itemize the things that the the trustee and the caregiver should focus on? Well, there's lots of ways to do that calculation. Um, the case you're referring to is Leona Helmsley. Yes. Yep. And she did set aside about twelve million dollars for her dog Trouble. Was it that, the much? York, it was that much? Yep, it was that much. And the New York courts actually came in and reduced it to approximately a million dollars, saying that twelve million dollars was too much for the dog. Um, I personally disagree with that outcome because I believe that it was Leona's money and she should be able to leave it to whom and how and how much she wants and not leave that to the discretion of the court. Mm -hmm. But you're correct, Florida does have a provision in our pet trust statute that would allow for a reduction in the amount left if it seemed to be excessive. So what I recommend to my clients is um, to carefully choose their remainder beneficiaries because ultimately that's who could potentially complain about the amount being excessive. And then secondarily, um, sometimes we leave a fixed dollar amount, so 10000 50000 100000 depending on the type of pets or the need of the pets. Or sometimes we use a formula calculation based on the age of the pets and the type of the pets and then how much money we spend currently for the care of our pets. So there's lots and lots of different ways you can do that. Each individual client situation is going to be different. Um, I do have many clients, Howard, that want to leave their entire estate for the benefit of their pets um, because they want to make sure that the pets really don't ever run out of money. And um, I tend to err on the side of being more conservative in the sense that if they want to leave 100% of their estate, I encourage them to do so, but with the caveat that we choose our remainder beneficiaries carefully. And then also, uh, once you've done that, though, of course, and the pet does it, or pets do expire, then uh, there's a remainder man out there to, to receive whatever happens to be left over. Exactly. So there would be some yeah. termination provisions in the trust saying that um, when the last of the pets passes away, the trust would terminate and then be distributed to these remainder or final beneficiaries. And for many of my clients, this would not necessarily be people, but it could potentially be their favorite pet charities. I see. Uh -huh. um, what are you? Do, do you do you find that you have a fair amount of pet, pet provisions in your uh, uh, revocable living trust for uh, your clients? Is that something you do on a, a fairly frequent basis? On a relatively frequent basis, um, I am known for saying that a hundred percent of my clients do something for their pets, mm -hmm. whether it's simply acknowledging the pets and saying that the children will have the responsibility for caring for the pets, to making an outright distribution of the pet along with some money or um, in a lot of cases creating um, that full-blown pet trust with lifetime care provisions for the pets. Have you ever uh, experienced, Peggy, a situation where the decedent did not plan for the pet or pets and did you have to like petition the court or you know, in some way try to uh, have the personal representative get the authority to set aside money to care for pets for, at least for a transition period. Have you ever experienced anything like that? Fortunately I've not had that experience when someone passed away Howard but that is not a necessarily an uncommon occurrence in the event in the event somebody becomes 
mentally incapacitated during their lifetime mm -hmm. and is now the subject of a guardianship. Yeah, so that pretty often in that context. I, I have not had to do that yet. Um, we we have uh, uh, because the you know somebody's always stepped up and just said, "Gee, uh, if nobody wants uh, Fido, I will take Fido and I'll I'll care for him." And the personal representative knew that individual and knew that they would be cared for, so it was done informally. Uh, we've had a couple though. It's been very difficult placing them because they were older pets. One was blind, and I I would I always say to clients if if you have a you know, a, a relatively young, healthy pet, that's going to be, you know, relatively easy to have an adoption for uh, or to place. But if you have a pet that's 10, 11 years old or, or, or older and they're blind or deaf or they have some issue, th that could almost be impossible uh, to place at some, in, in some families. And so it's, that's, it underscores why uh, the uh, client should, you know, have a provision that deals with that, so that there can be a transition. Because typically, the, uh, well, most canines don't live uh, much past, say, 14, 15 years old at, at the most. Uh, horses, though, Peggy, how long do, can a horse live? Um, I have known of horses that lived into their 40s, but oh. um, 25 to 30 is usually the lifespan of a horse. Mm -hmm. um, but think about people, Howard, that might have parrots, for example. Oh yes, um, yeah. Parrots can live seventy-five to a hundred years. Yeah, and uh, uh, and most of the time when we see, or at least when I see clients, they're in, at least into their fifties. Uh, many of them sixties and seventies or older, and so if they've got a, a relatively young parrot, <laughs> the, the parrot could easily outlive them for many, many years. And I, I have found that also birds can be a little harder to place. Uh, the, uh, dogs and cats seem to be relatively easy to p place, but anything beyond that, I mean, most people don't have the capacity to care for a horse. That requires, of course, special uh, attention that many people just don't have the wherewithal to do. But then again, that's what the trust is for. To uh, if the person has the time and the inclination to want to do it, the, then the trust the trustee can provide a, a reasonable amount of money to make certain that the veterinarian is is paid in the, uh, food. And I don't know what it takes to care for a horse. I know you do, but I suspect it's a heck of a lot more than my thirteen and a half pound schnauzer. So absolutely, and you'd be. <laughs> how much it costs <laughs> <laughs> yeah I have there's a lady in my neighborhood that she has now not where we live she boards them out but she has five horses and I I, I can't even imagine what her bill must be but that even underscores why you know if somebody passes and they have five horses they're going to have to set aside or have a fairly solid plan to deal with those horses uh, you know quickly right away and uh, I mean it's it, it, it and many of my clients have multiple pets, as I'm sure your does too. But when you get into the larger animals, uh, it's just going to cost more for everything. And um, uh, it, it doesn't have to be a real, real long trust. It can be a provision within a revocable trust is, or even an irrevocable trust, I suppose, as far as that goes. Uh, or it can be in your will. You certainly can put that in there. Uh, Peggy and I tend to uh, recommend in in, in many instances the use of a trust as opposed to a will but you would have a trust provision within the will so it would be a so-called testamentary trust for uh, your pet or pets. Um, and and Howard, I, I, those, those don't work great for pets. Um, I mean you can do it that way but I don't usually recommend them because of the time delays from the time of death until the time that a personal representative is appointed and has access to the funds. So usually I would recommend a revocable living trust with a testamentary pet trust. Yeah, I, and I, so would I, and I agree 100% with you, Peggy. Uh, I just, uh, uh, letting folks know that there is more than one way, and there, I, I, rarely, but every once in a while, I get someone that just doesn't want to do a living trust, no matter what. Uh, so that is available, but I would say, even even with what Peggy is recommending, and I certainly would concur that you you talk with that 
uh, person, your trustee and the caregiver. Now, that might be one and the same person, but if it's not, you want to talk with both of them. And you want to make Doug sure that when you're talking to them, they are not looking down at the carpet saying, oh, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll take care of it. You want to make look them in the eye and make darn sure that they really will do what they say they're going to do. I suspect that if you're talking to an individual, you probably know them, know them really or reasonably well, and you know what type of person they are, and if they say they're going to do something, they will. But don't just take it for granted. Uh, that is something, anything, whether it's the personal representative, a successor trustee, a caregiver for a pet, uh, uh, your healthcare surrogate designation person, any of those individuals should be spoken with and make sure that they're okay with this and that they really understand that it is a responsibility and one that they have to take seriously. Um, I, I, I don't think it's a good idea to have surprise stories. Uh, somebody passes away and next thing you know you have three pets on somebody's doorstep. So, uh, yeah, but, but I, and I, I'm dealing with a case right now where the lady was under the impression that she had created a trust for the benefit of her pets, but in the final analysis, it was not a very effective attempt at creating a trust, and in fact um, said that the language of the trust was precatory only, which means that it's only an expressed desire or intent and not really a trust, and as a result, we're having a lot of difficulty with the trustee honoring the provisions of the now deceased person for the care of her two elderly dogs, ages 12 and 14. Oh, yes, that would be, uh, yeah, the, there's a high probability that the dogs get that old that they're going to have, just like when people get old, they start having maladies that have to be dealt with. And, yeah, and, and that's a shame that the... Uh, that the trustee would take that position, um, and, and we I don't I'd have to go back and count how many of these we've done in our but I I know we've done at least twenty five at rock bottom minimum, uh, probably more than that, and we have yet to have any issues with them. I guess maybe we've just been lucky. We haven't had anybody come in uh, that has had a pet and that has had issues, even if they didn't have because we didn't do the estate plan. We just they came in the office. Uh, a relative and they want us to help settle the estate and they've got pets we've been able to get through it but it is tougher and it takes more time and it takes more energy and you uh, most people certainly including the I, can, I know I can speak for Peggy and certainly myself you know we cherish our pets they they I have always said that my little guy gives me a heck of a lot more than I give her. I try to give her as much as I possibly can, but uh, they don't ask for much. Uh, they're, they're pretty non-demanding for the most part, except when it comes to food time. Uh, and uh, maybe take, take them for a walk once in a while. And I think it's the least we can do is just make sure, it doesn't have to be a gigantically big provision in the, in the trust, but it does have to be spelled out. And I can guarantee you, if Peggy did the provision, it's rock solid. She'll make sure that it gets done properly, um, and, and and so would her her partners or in her associate too. I'm certain. Uh, but Peggy is the one that really got me started thinking about this very seriously be, before I had a pet, um, and uh, I'm so thankful for her for uh, focusing me on the fact that. Uh, We've been told many, many times when we went to the National Network breakout sessions that one of the biggest problems that people can have in settling a state is tangible personal property. Well, as I understand Florida law, we consider pets as tangible personal property. And I can see people having problems with oh, who's going to have possession and, and control or custody and uh, what are we going to do, is, is Sally going to have this? All these issues come up, gee, you're spending too much money on the pet, et cetera, et cetera. You can go a long way, I think anyone can, in their estate plan by mentioning this. And I think Peggy's mention about don't have pregatory language in there, meaning don't say, gee, it would be nice if you would do this. You want to say, you shall do this. You know, in other words, it's a command. You're demanding of the trustee. This is not something they can, they can do if they want to. They must do it. And I think that's, that's the language that has to be in there so that we don't give, by inadvertence, an out to a trustee that, I don't know, just doesn't like pets. Sadly, every once in a while, I run across people that don't like pets and they act accordingly. But I would say 
based on anecdotal evidence, seeing people come into my office, the vast, vast majority of people love their pets. So, um, Peggy, do you have anything you'd like to add? I, I promise people on these webinars that I'll keep it to about 20, 25 minutes. And then any questions? We have, I haven't seen anybody ask a question. We, we will, Peggy, by the way, have this up on our website. And we're going to send you a link, too, so you can have it on your website. And... Um, so that the people can listen to this at their leisure at a later date. And I, I would, people who are listening to this at a later date, if they have any questions uh, about pet trusts, they can certainly call my office. They can call Peggy's office, too. Peggy, what's your telephone number? Phone number is 407-977-8080, or you can also reach me at Peggy at HoytBryan, H-O-Y-T-B-R-Y-A-N.com. And all of our contact information is on uh, our website, and I, and I know uh, certainly for Peggy. And again, I, uh, Peggy, I want to thank you very, very much for taking the time to do this. And I, I know you love pets, uh, 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 probably more than anybody that I can even think of. And you've done a great service for writing that book, uh, and then all the work you do with your clients. And uh, uh, when when I was thinking about going to law school uh, many years ago, um, I was inspired by thinking that I could do good. And hopefully, I have over the years. Peggy, I know, has done good by the things that I've mentioned. And thank you so much, Peggy, for your time today. And I think this information for pet owners is just really important for them. And I would encourage people, if you have any, if you're in the Oviedo area, or no matter where you are, if you're a resident of Florida, you certainly could never go wrong by uh, checking in with uh, Peggy or any of the lawyers at her firm. Peggy, thank you very much for uh, volunteering your time today. I appreciate it. Howard, it's my pleasure, and um, I guess the last thing I would say is, uh, until there are none, adopt one. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I, uh, the next time uh, I have the opportunity to have another uh, pet friend in my home, I'm going to adopt, because uh, there's so many canines and felines out there that uh, deserve homes, and they're being put to death uh, at, at just unbelievable rates and thank you for mentioning that Peggy. You're welcome and um, I, w I wish each of your listeners good luck in planning for their pets and uh, they do make such a big difference in our lives. Boy they sure do. Well, uh, To everyone that's listening in I want to say thank you and for those that are going to listen in later uh, on the recording I say thank you too. Again our, uh, we, I have a sincere invitation to contact us if you have any other questions. And with that Peggy I'll, I'll sign off and uh, say goodbye and I'll look forward to seeing you uh, much sooner than later. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye.